Our final session will discuss 60 years of Merdeka, Quo Vadis, Malaysia. This session will be moderated by Dr. Francis Hutchinson, Senior Fellow of ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Dr. Hutchinson, please. So in our sixth and final session of today, we will look at prevailing dynamics in Malaysia and see what implications they hold for the coming year. Of key importance, of course, are the 14th general elections, which must be held by August. The run-up to the elections has been fascinating, with many things that have been seen to be solid melting into air. So on one hand, we've had the previous two coalition system fracturing into three political groupings with evolving and dissolving alliances and agreements. We've also seen the birth of two new political parties, Party Amana Negara and Party Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia. And lastly, we've also seen a renamed, rebranded, and recomposed Pakatan Harapan with Mahathir Mohamed as its, albeit transitional, prime ministerial candidate. Beyond the intricacies of continuing developments, Malaysia watchers, I'm one of them, many of my colleagues are, we've all had our confidence and nerves dented because one window of opportunity after another for the elections has been opened and closed, and those of us predicting things have more than often got them wrong. So in order to help us navigate our way through the forces, factions, facets, and forecasts concerning the elections, we are joined today by two eminent commentators on Malaysian politics. Our first speaker on my uh, left, Dato Sari Kalimula Hassan, is a veteran journalist who has worked for Time Magazine, Reuters, and Singapore Press Holdings before entering the private sector. Since then, he has juggled his corporate commitments with journalism through serving as the chairman of the national news agency, Bernama, as well as group editor-in-chief of the New Straits Times. His presentation is entitled, Politics, Race, and Religion, Malaysia's Cross to Bear. Our second speaker, on my right, Datu Sari Azman Ujang is also an accomplished journalist with some 40 years with Bernama in various capacities, including as chairman, general manager, and editor-in-chief. He also serves in other capacities, such as council member of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. Uh, he will speak to us first on the overall situation in Malaysia before zeroing in on Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, so each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes, after which we will proceed to Q&A. With this, if I could please uh, invite Dr. Dato Sari Kalimula to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, From the conversations we have had over lunch uh, and uh, my meetings with uh, my colleagues and friends in Singapore, uh, they obviously seem to be very interested in what's going to happen in Malaysia. The chattering class and civil society in Malaysia are rooting for change. Uh, but in the past, their views have not really prevailed over the was uh, rural electorate, which has traditionally been pro the ruling uh, Barisan National Coalition. Still. Since the dramatic 2008 uh, general election where the ruling coalition lost its two-thirds majority, and in 2013 when it lost the popular vote, but still maintained uh, its grip on power, its share of rural votes has been declining. The peak was in 1995 when uh, they won 65% of the popular votes. But in terms of parliamentary majority, the best election was 2004 when they won 90% of the parliamentary seats. Since then, both the popular votes and parliamentary majorities have been declining, with 2013 being the worst ever in its history. They won only 59% of, uh, of the parliamentary seats with 46% of the popular votes. Uh, we all know that the next general election has to be called by June this year, um, and uh, in the last five years, the government has been wrecked with financial scandals and inability to curb rising cost of living, 
inequality of income and as yet an unclear vision for the future. After more than a decade of steadily losing its rural lifeline, common sense would dictate that Prime Minister Najib's government faces an uphill task in regaining a comfortable majority. In fact, as an observer of Malaysian politics and having seen the last eight general elections, either as a journalist or as an insider, I would say that this is one election that I will not be comfort comfortable in predicting. There are too many new parts to the equation and any prediction would be at best an educated guess. Since 1955, when the first elections were held and since 63, after the formation of Malaysia, save for one blip in 1969, the rural areas have traditionally been the vote bank for the National Front and its predecessor, the Alliance. And since 63, the relatively underdeveloped states of Sabah and Sarawak, which today account for one quarter uh, of the seats in Parliament, have almost overwhelmingly voted for the Barisan National, so much so that they are referred to as the Barisan's fixed deposit. Similarly, the rural heartland in the peninsula, such as where there are Felda rural land development schemes, which account for almost another quarter of the parliamentary seats, have also traditionally supported the National Front. But today, save for Sarawak, it appears that it will be down to the wire in Felda seats and in Sabah. There is no question, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that the traditional National Front vote bank is hurting. Job opportunities are getting scarcer, cost of living has gone up, subsidies on many essential items such as petrol have been removed, college education is no longer a guarantee of a good job, the ringgit has considerably weakened against other currencies, so much so that even other cheap havens like Thailand and India now are more expensive. So does that mean that the traditional World Bank is going to go against a government beset with corruption scandals and the bungling political leadership? That's what many of the pundits and uh, intellects want to believe. But after seeing Brexit and Donald Trump, and in the absence of reliable polling, I'm not so sure. My gut feel tells me that it could go either way. The trends over the last decade tell me that it could go either way. Anecdotal evidence in my travels throughout the country tell me that it could go either way. Yet, as we all know, when you're about to mark the ballot paper, there are many other considerations which come into play. And some of these considerations defy logic. I think myself as an example, I'm a businessman, I'm well-traveled, and I think although some of my friends may dispute that, I think I'm well-read. In uh, 2013, I had resolved that I could not in end all conscience vote for the Barisan National. And I went to vote to fulfill that resolve. Yet, as I looked at the ballot paper, I realized that all my life I'd only voted for the Barisan National. And I was not sure if the opposition alliance, then uh, if it won, they could rule better. I've been proven right to a certain extent because while the ruling party was, has continued to disappoint, the opposition alliance, a hodgepodge coalition of differing di dreams and ideologies, which a journalist friend of mine once described as the gang that could not shoot straight, has broken up with his strongest ally, which is the Theocrat Theocratic Party Islam. And, uh, but I was already in the booth and I had to vote. So I split my vote. For parliament, I voted the BN candidate whom I believe was sure to lose. And for state, I voted for the opposition candidate who I was convinced would win by a huge margin. I was right on both accounts. I appeased my conscience and as, uh, you know, I, I think I'm relatively smart. But I'm, I'm not sure that's how, that how I voted would be how a smart man votes. Therefore, as I've said earlier, I will not predict as I could be wrong. But one thing I'm sure, this, the ruling party's toughest fight in its sixth decade polling history. Um, you know, uh, most of us have a psychological block given that Malaysia has never been ruled by any other party than the Barisan National. There's a mindset and belief that no matter what, the ruling coalition will not lose. As human beings, we are afraid of uncertainty, just like in Singapore, where it's unthinkable that the PAP can lose power. In Singapore, the loss of one seat in Anson in the 1980s uh, traumatized the PAP. But today, Singapore has come to accept that even giants like Giorgio can lose. 
So similarly, since 2008, Malaysians have come to accept that there is a two-party state in the country and the current opposition can and may one day sit on the government benches. There are grounds for the psychological block. Um, uh, for example, although the opposition parties seem to have greater traction in working together in the last two general elections, still they shoot themselves in the foot all the time. Nevertheless, their decision to appoint uh, or anoint the 92-year-old ex-Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad as the Prime Minister-designate and their agreement uh, on seat allocations last weekend is certainly a major achievement. In reality, the opposition parties do not have any other person as yet who can hold them together other than Mahathir for all his faults. Some may view the opposition's choice of Mahathir and Anwar's inexperienced wife, Dr. Wan Aziza, as the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister designate as a band-aid solution. Indeed, it is a band-aid solution. But given that besides Anwar, who is jailed, and there is no one else who can command the respect and hold this loose coalition together, Mahathir is probably the best solution for them, and Mahathir has shown in the past that he is a formidable adversary. I believe the opposition has made inroads, but they're still not yet a totally cohesive force. Uh, they are not yet a totally cohesive force. But uh, with Mahathir, they have opened many doors, like in the Malay majority, Kedah State, uh, where he comes from, and in Malay-dominated Felda schemes, which were out of bounds previously to the opposition. But even Mahathir has failed to make inroads into the fixed deposit states of Sabah and Sarawak, whose populace have a deep mistrust for those from the peninsula, in particular Mahathir, who is associated, rightly or wrongly, with many of the ills facing the country, such as granting citizenship to Filipinos in Sabah to enlarge the Barisan Nationals vote bank in the 1990s. Further, the propensity and ability of the ruling party, despite its mounting weaknesses and scandals, to dish out money and goods during the pre-election and election campaign will have some effect in many of the rural areas. How does the unhappiness with the scandal-riven government offset the benefits of handouts? Does it square itself off and the vote bank remains with the ruling party or will the people take the handouts and vote for change because they're just so fed up? If we go by voting trends in the past 60 years, money plays a role. So, while I'm very sure that Barisan National is again likely to lose the popular vote in the next general election, I'm not so sure that it will lose its parliamentary majority. My view is that uh, the last two general elections have shown that uh, while people accept the two-party system uh, and also the weaknesses in the opposition, the opposition has made a lot of inroads into staunch Barisan strongholds. Hence, uh, while it's very, very unlikely for the Barisan to win back its two-thirds majority, uh, it's probably scraped through with a, if I have to make a prediction, i say it's probably scraped through with a minor, uh, uh, slim majority. I think the more important thing is not so much what's going to happen in elections, which party wins, because if you ask me frankly, uh, there's not much to choose between politicians on both sides. You really don't see, uh, uh, there probably are brighter guys more on the opposition side, but uh, other than that, I don't see a vision. But I think what is uh, more important is the scenario after the elections. Uh, what will happen uh, in, in Malaysia? Let's... Uh, uh, Malaysia as a nation has been sliding fast down the slippery slope. And uh, what we do post-2018 general elections, after almost 10 years of being in a stupor because of the incessant politicking, will decide whether we continue to slide or whether we make a serious attempt at retaking our place uh, as one of the leading economies in this part of the world. A sad fact is that over the years, race, religion and politics have consumed Malaysians. As a fledgling nation, our founding fathers used to say that our diversity was our strength. In fact, one of the strongest taglines that has made Malaysia well-known throughout the world was its tourism promo, Malaysia Truly Asia. But in the last decade, we have seen divisions over race, religion and politics worsen, and today, Malaysia is a very polarized country. The education system we inherited from the colonialists has slowly but surely declined, and those who can afford it prefer private education, which has seen private schools and colleges mushroom. This further adds to the inequality in income and the socio-economic divide. 
the so civil service and system of government, probably one of the other things that we can thank the British colonialists for, has also declined considerably. Corruption has flourished, and people don't bat an eyelid when they hear of one or two million dollars being misappropriated. Businessmen privately moan and groan about the corruption and leakages, but the truth is, there's many of these same businessmen who have corrupted the country by greasing palms and then raking in money by overcharging and overbilling in contracts or providing public services. Civil servants and politicians have been found to live far beyond their means, with tens and in some cases more than a hundred million ringgit in cash and valuables stashed in their bank accounts or hidden in their homes. Integrity is no longer that prized a virtue. Independent media virtually doesn't exist in Malaysia, and the practitioners of social media, the so-called influencers, are generally as bad as the corrupt politicians they criticize selectively. And law enforcement agencies have lost so much credibility that even when they act against those breaking the law, the perception is that the perpetrator probably ran afoul of politics rather than running afoul of the law. The custodians and the institutions which in the early years contributed to a strong Malaysia because of their integrity, their patriotism and their desire to see enforcement, enhancement in the fortunes of their fellow countrymen, people such as senior public servants, politicians, judges, heads of government agencies, these people are getting rarer and rarer today. I'm not saying that the majority of these custodians have gone onto the dark side. They're still good people with good values. What I'm saying is that the majority of these good people, these custodians and institutions, have been cowed into silence and close an eye or look the other way more often than stand firm on principles of integrity. The more custodians that seal their lips and look the other way, the more Malaysia will slide down the abyss to the point of no return. The famous Renaissance poet Dante is attributed with having said that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of moral crisis, preserve their neutrality. It's a nice quote. But when faced with a choice of being censured, losing their jobs and their perceived respectability, do people in that position worry about a hell they have not seen? A hell that only faith will make us believe in. Or do they try to escape the living hell of a vindictive and oppressive regime? For many, it's easier to look the other way because state and non-state actors can shell out retribution with impunity in Malaysia, stifling the dissenting voice into silence. But if Dante is right, then I can safely say that there are many in Malaysia who occupy important posts in government and in commerce today, who will be seated next to each other in the hottest seats in hell. Judges, law enforcement officers, tycoons, journalists. We'll all be there commiserating in misery. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia is not the only country to face such problems, but Malaysia did not have these problems on this scale in its early days. That's why it was successful. If we look at the world's most successful nations, we find that they succeeded because they invested in education, in building values, in strengthening the rule of law, in ensuring the sanctity of institutions, in fighting corruption and abuse of power, in allowing freedom of expression, freedom of practicing religion, while curbing extremism, a healthy environment for civil society to flourish, conditions for job creation and economic growth, and improving the quality of life of their people. In a post-2018 general election scenario, no matter which party comes to power, Malaysia's future will depend on whether they abandon the, practice, the practices that have become the norm and work on building up the values which made it successful in the past. The system is not totally broken. It can still be fixed. Malaysia is not yet a failed state and can still be rescued. It is a daunting task, but if we look at Singapore, which is almost a backwater just 50 odd years ago, or Hong Kong, which is riddled with corruption, and look how it, at how they came out of it, then surely I believe Malaysia can also do it. But if it is business as usual post-general elections 2018, then, ladies and gentlemen, I fear for the future of my country. I fear for the future of my children and my grandchildren. And if nothing changes, then the cross we bear because of race, religion, and politics in Malaysia will also be the cross that our future generations have to bear. And the scary part is that we may not come out of it for a long, long time. 
perhaps generations. I would have loved to end this talk on an upbeat tone, but when I last spoke at the ISIS Regional Forum several years ago, I had warned about the slippery slope that Malaysia had embarked upon. But there were few in the audience who said that I was too pessimistic. Unfortunately, not too much that has happened since then has managed to lift me out of my pessimism. In fact, as I feared then, any enthusiasm I might have felt when others disagreed with me, well, that too has diminished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I could now invite Dato Sari Azman to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hutchison. Uh, my friend, Dr. Kali, is a former chairman of Bernama, so he could afford to be a pessimist, but I am the present chairman, I can't afford to be as pessimistic as him, uh, for obvious reasons. Just over a year ago, uh, November 8, 2016 to be exact, I was granted an exclusive interview by your Prime Minister, Mr. Slee Sian Lung, uh, for Bernama. It was uh, significant uh, because it was the first one-on-one -on -one interview between a Malaysian journalist and a Singapore Prime Minister. I, like, I think so. The Prime Minister was about 40 minutes late for the interview, and when he came into the room at the Istana, he uh, apologized. Uh, I told him that I understand his schedule is very tight, and I would wait for him uh, no matter what, no matter how long. I was tempted to tell him another thing, but which I didn't, and which was, it's nice to know that not everything runs on time in Singapore. <laughs> Let me thank ISIS, uh, Isabi Star Institute, for inviting me here today to share my thoughts, first of all, on the biggest event to take place in Malaysia very soon, which is our 14th general election. The date that many people are speculating the GE will take place is during the one-week window for the first-term school holiday that begins on March 16. There's a one-week holiday. Um, the most likely, or the likely polling date is Saturday, 24th March. That's spe speculation, anyway. Uh, polling day in a Malaysian general election is always uh, held on a Saturday and during the school holiday so far. Because school premises are the most ideal location for polling stations, because we have schools in every nook and corner of the country. And before that is going to happen, what will happen is Malaysian Parliament will sit on the 3rd of March, it was announced today, to pass a very important uh, bill or law, uh, that is the new electoral boundaries, uh, which uh, I think the Barisan National is uh, keenly awaiting, because before uh, it is passed, I think they would like this to, to pass first, uh, before uh, parliament will be dissolved, or before polling day. It is said that it is going to be the mother of all elections. Will it live up to the billing? I don't know for sure who's more powerful or influ influential in a family, whether it's mother or father, but all of us here would agree that when it comes to a husband and wife, it's the wife who calls the shot and always prevails. The BN or National Front, Barisan National or National Front, coalition of parties in power in Malaysia or it, its predecessor, the Alliance or Parti Perikatan, is the longest-running political force continuously running a country without a break in the world since 1957. The second longest, I think, being the PAP here in Singapore. Correct me if I'm wrong. For the first time, the BN, like my friend said just now, uh, lost its always taken for granted majority in two-thirds majority in parliament in the 2008 election. And five years later, in 2013, it lost even more ground, you heard earlier. In fact, in mainland or peninsular Malaysia, the BN in the 2013 uh, election won less seats, 86 to 89, than the opposition parties, which had their own coalition pact, then called Pakatan Rakyat or People's Alliance. Pakatan Rakyat was presented, was prevented actually from coming to power at the federal level or at Putrajaya by the BN's landslide wins in Sabah and Sarawak. And it's for this reason that 
uh, my friend Kali also alluded to this, that the two East Malaysian states adopt the BN fixed deposits. The BN won a total of 47 seats in the two states, 22 in Sabah and 25 in Sarawak. In these two states, past the Islamist party, which is the major political force in the peninsula, has never been able to win any seats after several attempts. And the status quo shall prevail this time, I think. There is a stark contrast between this election this time around, yeah? And the watershed polls in 2008 and 2013, when the BN lost the popular votes and the two-thirds majority for the first time. This is because the three opposition parties, Parti Keadilan Rakyat, PKR, DAP, PAS, which were united against the BN then under Pakatan Rakyat, are somewhat in disarray now. PAS has since left the Pakatan Rakyat, or Pakatan Harapan we call it now, which has, uh, yeah. There, there's also been two breakaway or splinter parties form, uh, the moderator said earlier, Parti Amanah Negara by some former PAS leaders who are from the non-ulama or non-cleric group, which all lost in the party elections in 2015, and the AMNO splinter party called Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia, led by none other than our former Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, and ex-Deputy Prime Minister Mohidin Yassin. Politics seems to therefore get more complicated in Malaysia. In the previous two GEs, it was straight fight in most areas in peninsula between the BN and Pakatan Rakyat. So it presented a very clear choice to the voters. It's either one or the other. And more significantly, for the previously fractious plethora of opposition parties, they were united under their own front. But not anymore, we know that. There is now the BN on one side facing PAS, now going it alone, and the Pakatan Harapan Alliance comprising four other parties in another corner. In other words, while we saw straight fights before, there's now going to be at least three cornered fights or three cornered contests, BN, PAS, and Pakatan Harapan. With the opposition parties no longer as united as before, the votes among their supporters are going to be split, and in mathematic, simple mathematical terms, it's going to benefit the BN more than ever, more than before, I think, in my opinion. Although during Pakatan Harapan's Congress just held two days ago, leaders of the four parties, DAP, PKR, PB, PBBM, and Amanah, seem to have close ranks when they declared that they have agreed in, on which party to contest where, and equally significant, they reached a consensus in naming Dr. Mahathir Mohamad as Pakatan's choice for Prime Minister should they win the election. It is still seen, it is still seen or perceived as by the public as a loose alliance, and it would take some time before they gel. And time is not on their side with election just around the corner. As things stands, the going will be, in my opinion again, easier for the BN this time compared to the previous two GEs. Uh, rather, an opinion poll conducted by the Merdeka Center in December finds that although the BN's share of the popular vote is likely to shrink further. A combination of three cornered fights and the new electoral boundaries I spoke earlier, under what we call the re-delineation exercise, could even enable the BN to regain a two-thirds majority in parliament, according to this survey released two days ago. After all, the BN is just 13 seats, 13 short, 13 seats short of achieving its two-thirds majority in parliament. Of course, uh, poor opinion polls can go very wrong. Uh, of course, the biggest uh, advantage for any party in power, we all know that thing, in a general election, especially in Malaysia at least, is its incumbency with all the resources at its disposal. And we're all away again, the general election in Malaysia requires tremendous resources. But as in most a uh, recent election, some surprises and upsets here and there cannot, however, be totally ruled out or discounted. Come election day, as parties have their own trump cards, 
and or strategies which they normally would not reveal until, like the saying goes, it's like saving the best for last. So some surprises could be in store. But by and large, it has all the makings of being the father of, father actually, the Prime Minister Najib called it uh, few day, uh, one, week, one or two weeks ago, the father of all elections. With the battle lines and the battle for votes going to be most intense and more and more to be fought via the social media as well. One other major setback or major handicap for the Pakatan Harapan Front against when compared to the previous two elections is the fact that the de facto opposition leader, Anwar Ibrahim, won't be physically around this time to spearhead the campaign. He was there in the previous two elections, and Anwar being the consummate orator that he is notorious for, is arguably the biggest crowd puller always in any election campaign in Malaysia. I would argue that the rather massive wins by the Pakatan Rakyat uh, in the previous election when PAS was still in that pack was due to Anwar's leadership in the opposition front. By the same token, the major split that led to PAS quitting Pakatan Rakyat was also due to Anwar not being the glue that binds them because he again had to serve another prison sentence. The latest news from prison is that from the prison is that Anwar will finally be released on June 8, following a one-third remission of his five-year term. But by that time, the general election is, will be long over. Now, let us talk about the battle for the two most developed states in Malaysia, Selangor and Penang. The focus of the BN this time would certainly be on trying or going all out to regain control of the two prized states of Selangor and Penang that it lost to the Pakatan Front in 2008 and again in 2013. These two states contribute substantially to the country's GDP. The voting trends in Malaysia show that the urban voters are largely with the Pakatan Front, while the BN is the popular choice in the rural constituencies, although uh, votes have also shrunk. Large swaths of territory in Malaysia are still very rural in nature, where people are not influenced by social media to lack of things like internet penetration, unlike in Singapore or other cities. But so we see the BN losing in most of the urban seats where the electorate are more educated or informed. It's still going to be very tough for the BN, BN's Chinese based component parties like MCA and Gerakan uh, to master Chinese support, again, which overwhelmingly is the domain of the DAP. But something historic happened a few days ago when leaders of the MCA and Gerakan have ganged up for the very first time and announced that they will face the coming polls in one voice rather than being rivals within the BN as, as uh, previously. Now, uh, to conclude, I would like to mention the topic cited in the program, Sabah and Sarawak in Malaysia 54 years, 54 years later. In the last couple of years, some small groups of individuals, including politicians and NGOs, have emerged in Sabah and Sarawak, imbued with some reawak reawakening spirit to assert or reassert what they perceive as their rights under the Malaysia Agreement signed in 1963 or MA63 that paved the way for the formation of Malaysia on September 16, 1963. This is the same MA63 that applied to Singapore in your two years of unhappy marriage in the new federation prior to the split on August 9, 1965. Most of you in the audience, I think, here today were not born yet when Malaysia came into being. But just as a background, Malaysia was formed because Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore wanted to join the Federation, given the circumstances, particularly the regional geopolitical ones that prevailed then. Initially, this group, that, this reawakening, uh, reawakened groups, huh, 
use the social media to gather support, and then on the roads, one can see many cars displaying stickers, S for S, S for S stickers that stand for Sabah for Sabahans or Sarawak for Sarawakians. It gathered greater momentum in Sarawak rather than in Sabah, particularly when the late Tansi Adnan Satem took over as Chief Minister of Sarawak in 2014 from Tun Abdul Taib Mahmud, who was Chief Minister for 32 years. The previous Chief Minister and previous one before him never raised uh, what we call uh, some anti-federal uh, sentiment or uh, more provo provocative federal st uh, statements against federal for the last 42 years before Adnan Satem came into being. There, was, there wasn't such a happening in the decades prior to that. Eh? Adnan had, among other things, called for the reinstatement via an amendment to the Article 1 of the Federal Constitution back to its original wording. What does it entail? Before Article 1 was amended in Parliament in 1976, and with, all the, with the support of all members of Parliament from Sarawak, actually, itself, Sarawak was designated as Region 2 in the Federation. But with the amendment in 1976, Sarawak, and for that matter, Sabah, just became another state, just like the other 11 states in what used to be known as Malaya. According to some politicians in the state, the amendment to Article 1 in 1976 had the effect of curtailing the disbursement of federal funds for Sarawak as well as Sabah to a level of a state rather than two of the three founding partners of the Federation. So they want it uh, to be amended. There could be some other implications as well and a cabinet committee has been formed to look deeper into these issues. For example, the Chief Minister of Sarawak last year set up a rival company to Petronas, our national oil company. It's called Petros. Uh, because he says Sarawak, rather than just being a bystander in the oil, oil and gas industry, wants to partake in the industry as well. And as well as calling for a higher uh, oil royalty, which is now 5%. Prime Minister Najib Razak, on a recent visit to Sarawak, last month actually, promised that the federal government would return those rights if they actually had been taken from the two states. So it's, it's work in progress. So we shall see what happens next. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you very much to both speakers for their insightful presentations. Before uh, opening uh, for Q&A, I would like to sneak in a sort of hypothetical question to both of our speakers, and that is, let's say, given redelineation, given the structural advantages of incumbency, Barisan Nacional remains in power with a reduced majority, so it doesn't retain or doesn't regain two-thirds majority, it perhaps loses a, a few seats, and is unable to reclaim Selangor, the prize in the, in the, in the crown. Could there be pressure from within Barisan Nacional on Prime Minister Najib? Uh, could there be some sort of transition? And what sort of form would this take? So if I could invite both of our speakers perhaps to uh, look a little bit forward beyond the immediate uh, elections. Um, it's, uh, like you said, it's a hypothetical question. So, um, But uh, uh, I think this Prime Minister has shown uh, that he has got a strong grip on the people within his party and uh, also within the coalition. Um, fair means or foul, he'll keep them in line. And I, I don't mean it in a bad way, I just, I'm just saying that that's how politics works. Uh, so if the Barisan National does win the election, I don't think you're going to see the back of Najib for a long, long time. One formula that used to work uh, I mean, Kedah, the state of Kedah was at, some years ago, was under PAS rule, yeah? 
but the Barsan National had a strategy. Uh, they named Dr. Mahadev's son, Mukris, that time was still in, very much in uh, Amno, as the potential Chief Minister or Menteri Besar of Kedah should the Barsan National regain or retake Kedah state uh, from uh, past. Uh, so he announced some one week before polling day that this guy will be our MB, we call it, Menteri Besar or Chief Minister of Kedah, should we retake Kedah. If, uh, it worked because uh, the young voters, uh, one Mukris, a young, a young guy at that time, uh, to be uh, the Chief Minister, and while the old voters, the, uh, the older generation voters, still remember his father, what his father did, Mamahde, for 22 years Prime Minister. Of course, the last two years, they were no longer in the uh, or Amno. So, I know for a fact that uh, the Prime Minister and Barisan National really want very much to retake Selangor because it's the prized state. Yeah? It's just, you know, uh, the most developed state in the country. But they have failed twice and so far they have not had any uh, strategy to announce someone who is a new, fresh face or new face to be the potential Chief Minister of Menteri Besar of Selangor. We need someone in Amno, but there seems to be a dearth of, death, death of uh, new leaders among Amno in Selangor because for the last nine years or almost ten years now, Amno, the dominant party in Selangor, is the op opposition party. So I mean, they seem to have lost their compass as well because of being opposition for the last nearly 10 years or 9 years plus. So, uh, I guess uh, one strategy that is being worked out from sources that I spoke to is for PAS, which is no longer in that poll, in the opposition poll, uh, to have uh, some understanding with AMNO. PAS, PAS now holds, I think, 15 seats. In Selangor, in fact, more than uh, the party that has the chief minister's post. Uh, assuming PAS can command the same number of votes and AMNO have enough seats to, they will, they might form a coalition government in in, in Selangor per se, yeah? Selangor alone. So uh, that's one possible scenario for Selangor. Thank you. Uh, so now if we can uh, take uh, questions from the floor, please do wave your arms a little bit vigorously because there are many of us here. I see one gentleman there, please. Good, good afternoon. Okay. I'm over here. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think, I think the, what I wanted to ask uh, the speakers is, you know, for Malaysia, I, I, I don't think, I think the $6 billion question it's not one MDB, but the question is more, um, how, how do you get your politics right, right, longer term? So let's mm. look beyond the 2018 election for a while. Mm. Uh, we heard earlier from Manu Bhaskaran, the economist, I mean, Malaysia is growing quite nicely mm. on several fronts. And on the other hand, we heard from the Indonesia speaker about how in Indonesia, you know, they are downplaying the question of race, religion, going more by uh, taking a secular approach. Indonesia, of course, has the Pancasila philosophy. Yeah. And I think from an outside standpoint, looking at the region, I mean, Malaysia, to me, the trend is quite worrying because although you have economic growth, but you can't get your politics right. And in particular, you know, you have 60% Malay Muslim, 40% of the population being others, Chinese, Indian, and so on. And it seems like Malaysia wants to wish them away, like, can this 40% just disappear? I mean, you know, it's not going to happen. Uh, so this race-based politics for, goes on and on, and for 2018, we are still talking about PAS versus DAP versus etc. I mean, whereas Indonesia is emphasizing that parties should not be race-based or religious-based as far as possible. And even if you are, you, you don't campaign on that, you know. And so I think that's, that's the key question. I mean, can, can, you, can Malaysia get that right? Because otherwise, long term, I, I have my doubts. Okay, thank you. So one question on getting the politics right. And sorry, sir, there. Yes, please. Hussein Mutalib, I, I have two questions. Um, 
The two speakers, when referring to the possibility of an opposition-led government, uh, mentioned the names of Dr. Mahathir and Wan Aziza. Uh, missing is, of course, the man, Anwar Ibrahim. You know, as you rightly pointed out, and we all know this, that a few days ago, two days ago to be more specific, uh, Pakatan Harapan had its uh, consultation with uh, component parties. We were told, I don't know how valid is this news, we were told that if opposition were to win, they will seek a pardon from the king about Anwar Ibrahim, who is supposed to be released on June the 8th. And then Anwar will be made Prime Minister of Malaysia. We were told, we heard. Could you comment about the plausibility of this, uh, for the moment, rumour? The second question is referring more to Datu Sri Kalimula. You know, you began by highlighting a lot of interesting points about the general election forthcoming in Malaysia, but you ended by saying the more interesting, perhaps defining moment, will not be so much the elections, but post-election, right? Could you share with us uh, your concerns of a possible worst-case scenario for Malaysia after election? Will racial riots be part of your worry? Thank you. So thank you. So we have three questions, one on getting politics right, then the role of Anwar Ibrahim and the sort of transition process to bring him in, and then the last is on the post-election scenario. Please. Thank you very much. Was it Mano Sabnani who asked the question? First one, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Manu, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the problem is that we haven't got our politics right. So how do we get our politics right? I think uh, I mentioned uh, towards the end, I said that they have to correct uh, the uh, issues uh, uh, that I mentioned, corruption, education, uh, the politics of race, extremism and all that. So the one good thing that might come out of this election is that uh, party Islam, so Malaysia might be decimated. Uh, and to me, that will be a very good thing for Malaysia. Um, but uh, I disagree uh, with uh, your contention that uh, uh, Malaysia is a basket case. I think that's what you alluded to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I would agree that Indonesia has got its act together and is coming together, but it's all very recent. Uh, Indonesia had had, has had more than its share of bloodletting, so has Thailand. Thousands of people have been killed uh, in demonstrations and uh, riots, which you have not seen in Malaysia. So, uh, I'm not saying things are good, but they are not that bad, you know. Uh, so, to answer your question, whether Malaysia will get it right, like I said, you know, after the general election, see uh, who wins. Uh, if it's Prime Minister Najib, whether he has got the determination to discard business as usual and try to do things uh, to save his country, or whether if the opposition comes in, the current opposition, whether they will, they seem to have the say the right things, whether they will do things, uh, that all depends, I'm, I'm not really sure. I really hope that for the sake of my country, we get our act together. Uh, coming to the other question on uh, Anwar Ibrahim's name, whether they go for pardon or not, I think uh, there are two things you've got to consider. First, I would expect if uh, the opposition wins that they will definitely push uh, to get a pardon for Anwar. But you know, a pardon depends again on whether the king wants to give the pardon or not. So, uh, and uh, I, I don't think anybody can give you a, a, a correct answer on uh, on that. As to the last part of the question on uh, whether racial riots uh, are likely to happen in uh, Malaysia, people have been predicting that for a long time. Um, it's not happened. I think Malaysians have uh, uh, a more sensible, uh, but you know, it's happened in the best of countries. Uh, so 
I will not give a definitive no, but I think it's unlikely. Yeah, race-based politics, I think, will continue to be part and parcel of Malaysian politics. Uh, but we can't get things right, even with that. Uh, I mean, uh, things are not that bad. Uh, there's no such thing as we try to de decimate or whatever the other parties. But the reality of the politics is, is race-based. I don't foresee uh, in the whatever future that this will go away. But... Um, as for pardon for Anwar, they have said in not certain terms that if they come to power, the opposition parties, if they come to power, they will seek a pardon, royal pardon. So it can be done, I mean, if they are in power. So uh, in the interim period, they named the, uh, Dr. Mahdi as the interim prime minister. After all, he's going to be 93 years old anyway, next birthday on July 20th. So uh, that's the situation for a while, for the time being. We have time for another few questions. Any questions? Yes, please. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hok An. Uh, from ISIS, uh, Yusuf Isa Institute. Um, I'm going to uh, take a cue uh, from the, the quip about the mother of uh, up, this upcoming elections being the mother of all elections to bring in gender and also to uh, add to the litany of uh, complaints and things to get depressed about Malaysia to add one more which is uh, male dominance in politics and uh, patriarchy so uh, firstly about the participation of women uh, both you know uh, both coalitions uh, are uh, making pronouncements about having more women as candidates so how do you see uh, the prospects for that? Not just more, but also winnable, and um, winnable, uh, you know, can, uh, more candidates in winnable seats, because there's also been pushback that, oh, it's just going to be cosmetic in places that maybe UMNO has a, uh, for, in, for example, UMNO having a poor chance of uh, victory. And will that have an, uh, any long-term impact on politics in the terms of the participation? The women's uh, vote, it's uh, believed and supported by surveys that uh, women, uh, especially rural uh, Malay uh, women, tend to be you know, supportive of uh, BN and, and AMNO. Uh, but at the same time, women would also be relatively more attuned to the issue, to so-called rice bowl issues about cost of living, uh, cost of education, and you know, household kind of issues. So uh, how do you see that also playing out in, in the coming election? And on top of that, with uh, Wan Aziza as uh, Deputy Prime Minister designate for Pakatan Harapan, I think people are aware that, yes, she, it will be a caretaker position, but nonetheless, the power of that, uh, potential power, you know, symbolically, uh, of and as a breakthrough for the first time, a women uh, Deputy Prime Minister designate. How do you see the impact of, of that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I first... Uh, 2018 is a defining year for women. The Prime Minister had said that uh, for public listed companies, for example, before politics, yeah, uh, he will this year name and shame those companies uh, which do not have 30% women uh, board members, uh, members of board, this year, 2018. And uh, there will be... 30% of uh, members of the upper house, which we call the Senate, will be women this year. That's what he promised. So it's uh, really, uh, I think, what a shit year for women this year. I mean, uh, I would, I, I'm a really an uh, advocate of this all the while, uh, that more women should be uh, in, in um, positions of uh, decision-making decision, yeah, be post, yeah. So uh, we're going to have see it's happening in Malaysia this year. And uh, for the election candidates as well, there will be many, many more women uh, uh, candidates to be announced as uh, we go to the polls. All I've got to say is that Malaysia is still a very male-centric society, so uh, uh, I, I think uh, more women may be candidates, but uh, they have not actually realize the power that they've got to demand changes. Um, and I, I appreciate your views on one Aziza, but I think the, 
best person to have been a woman prime minister of Malaysia was Rafida Aziz, <laughs> and uh, she's long retired. Thank you. So we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, please. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I'm Thank you, Francis. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Francis. I'm Liu Chin Tong, a member of parliament from Malaysia. Uh, I just want to contribute to the debate. I think uh, Najib has missed his best moment to call election. Uh, that was in uh, late 2016. Had he called general election in late 2016, he probably will win with a smaller majority. But now I think it's an open question. So anytime, uh, you can swing both ways. And I don't think, uh, I think the debate, had, today's uh, discussion did not bring into the questions of a possibility of a Malay tsunami. And I think this election, if there's a 15% swing from Barisan National to the opposition to Pakatan Harapan, uh, that will end the rule of Barisan National. And I think if that swing happens in the West Coast, and if the opposition can win 100 seats in the peninsula, a new government will be formed. Thank you. Could I invite... Uh... That's not an independent view. That's coming from a opposition member of parliament. Anyway, thank you for your presence. <laughs> but uh, he did, has raised, I think, a legitimate question. Do you yeah. think that that is possible? I'll leave it. Uh, my good friend Chin Tong always putting us in trouble. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I think uh, based on logic and based on numbers, it makes sense that if there is uh, a uniform swing, uh, as you say so. But you know, elections are so unpredictable, it never happens that way. So I would, uh, I would think that which I told uh, Prof. Tommy earlier during lunch, I said this is one election which is possible for the Barisan National to lose. Uh, sentiments are not good on the ground. This is probably the most unpopular government ever to go into a general election. Um, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> It's a big story. But, you know, they're, they're not very honest people up there and uh, people are suffering on the ground. Uh, we've got a bunch of thieves. Uh, they're, they're <laughs> there's a lot of unhappiness. So there is possibility of uh, a Malay tsunami because the Malays are the ones hurting the most uh, this time around. Thank you very much. Well, uh, that is food for thought. And on that note, uh, we have now run out of time. So please do join me in thanking our two speakers for their very insightful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson and distinguished panelists. I would now like to invite Dr. Terence Chong, Deputy Director of ICS Yusof Ishak Institute, to the podium to deliver the closing remarks. Hello, everyone. Um, we've come to the end of a very long day. Uh, I think we all deserve a pat on the back for making it so far. Uh, as I was coming up, just before coming up, uh, Prof. Tommy Koh said, um, Terence, you better sum up everything that has been said today in two minutes. Um, I think to attempt that, you either have to be very foolish or brilliant. I'm somewhere in between, so let me instead start by listing five questions that I think we tried to address today. Okay? The first one is, what are the implications for Southeast Asia in light of the changing US-China relations? The second question that we address today what are the major global economic trends and how will they impact the region? Third, is ISIS gaining a foothold in Southeast Asia after Marawi? Fourth, what can we expect from the upcoming elections in Malaysia and Indonesia? And fifth, how well have the governments in Myanmar, Thailand and the Philippines dealt with their domestic security and political challenges? and what are their prospects for 2018. 
And with the guidance of our expert panellists, we have pondered these questions today. And they will no doubt stay with us for the months to come. On our part, in ISIS, we will continue these discussions through our many conferences, seminars and publications. So please join us uh, in our discussions by signing up on our mailing list. I'd like to end by thanking the ISIS staff who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes uh, to make today a success. And of course, last but not least, you, the audience, for being here today. And to end in true Singaporean style, I want to choke all of you for 9th of January 2019. Um, that's when we have our RWF next year, right here at uh, Shangri-La. So thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Chong. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the forum. Thank you for attending the Regional Outlook Forum 2018. We hope you had a wonderful time with us. Highlights from today's forum, including photos and videos, will be uploaded to our website in due course. Please take a few minutes to complete the mailing list and feedback forms and do bring your completed feedback forms to the registration booth for a complimentary copy of ISIS Trends. Once again, thank you for your great support and we look forward to seeing you again at next year's Regional Outlook Forum which will be held on 9 January 2019. Thank you and I wish you all a pleasant evening ahead.